Thank you. I don't know why we're a little well, wonky. <laughs> and advanced veterinary uh, at Glacier Peak High School. And I'm told that Mike Wallace is here because when I was a new teacher about 19 years ago, it was Mike Wallace who was uh, really inspirational to me, maybe you don't know that, um, about getting in and really um, advancing my animal stuff and being brave and learning new things and reaching out to my community. Uh, and so as my program has grown, I work in a fairly urban suburb um, and most of my kids that make it to my advanced class want to be veterinarians or they think that they want to be veterinarians. Um, and so <clears throat> by the time they get to my advanced class, they're probably involved with FSA. They've probably been out to our partner barn, Twine Shire, and worked with pigs. Uh, they have probably uh, done some summer work or intern work with one of our local veterinarians. Um, so this is something that we do uh, a couple months in to remind them of the skills. I do teach suturing to my freshmen, not because I think they're going to be suturing, but it's really fun to play with medical tools and pretend that you're there. And um, and I just, I love getting them inspired about the work. And also it starts their skills. So if they're really excited about it, um, there's some things that I send home with their family so they can practice and keep up that, um, that skill. So this is actually an assessment that I do with my students. It's a, it takes about a week to get through it all because um, we are very slow in our process. <laughs> and I know that some people might uh, move a lot faster. Um, please come and grab a banana and suture if you're going to be uh, uh, playing today. Um, but with my students, I have a really, I work with a lot of um, both doctors and veterinarians. and. Um, I have a very strong philosophical belief about process and taking your time and thinking things through before we move and creating a mental state about the work as well. Um, those of us that are here probably work with a lot of veterinarians and it's a very stressful and can be kind of a um, anxiety ridden career. And so talking my kids through that, uh, that mind space is just an important part of my practice, so. Um, so this is more than suturing 101, we call it banana Um, So again, this is the PowerPoint that I share with my kids. In this week-long activity, you may be working with the following items, scalpel, suture, scrub. We'll use water with a drop of iodine for realism, gloves. Prior to beginning this activity, you should list these items in your journal. Write down appropriate safety protocol. You'll be reviewing safety protocol and we'll be using your notes to start discussion. Be ready to share. So one thing that has changed a lot in my program, um, just in the past couple of years, is that my administration is very uncomfortable all of a sudden, even though I've been doing this for 19 years, that I have needles in my classroom or chemicals in my classroom. Um, and so there has to be a safety awareness slide on almost all of the work that I do these days. So that kind of balms the, the administrators. Um, so we talk a lot about breathe, think, and talk. Um, and so and I say in training, you can't act on instinct. That comes with time. That's a, that's a mature way. You know, those of us that have worked with animals for a long time, Margaret just knows. She knows what to do, and it's already part of her practice. Um, but I don't want the kids just working on instinct. So I ask, always ask them to check their breath, think about all of their steps ahead of time, and talk out their process with me or their partner. Um, so it takes a veterinary village, holds two processes. Okay, so this is our day one. So client has come into clinic, they're concerned, hesitant to spay, neuter their pet. Using the cost, fear, or misinformation framework, how can you help them feel more secure and build a doctor-client relationship? What are three benefits to spay, neuter? Your client feels more empowered with this information and they want to schedule an appointment. What instructions do they need to have about bringing their pet in on surgery day? What about aftercare? Create the two-in-one handout you will give them. Quality communication improves client's confidence, assures best practice care, and saves time and money. So, creating 
in documentation and in pictures. Um, and so I have just some of the uh, examples of different veterinary places. And these are some of their consent forms so that they can start learning the language and start understanding uh, what it means legally and there's a lot that they have in common and we talk about you know making sure that our clients again feel empowered feel supported and they know what to expect um, for those of you that get that practice magazine or vet tech magazine there's a lot a lot of issues come up when we've done something, particularly around dental care right now, the patient comes back and they, you've had to pull more than one tooth, you've pulled three or four, and they're very upset. Um, not just at cost, but just they didn't expect that. And so really talking through process and how we communicate well, this might be the outcome. Some clinics choose to text really quick when a change is made, like we need to do three, are you ready to approve that? but not all clinics do. So this is one thing that they work on together in their teams. Um, cost. While getting a pet might seem inexpensive, keeping up with well checks, spay, neuter, vaccine, dental care, parasite treatment and specialty diets can be overwhelming. Clients often feel embarrassed to talk about money and may avoid care due to cost. And here are four ways that clinics can improve that discussion. And so then I give them this. Um, <laughs> and these are things that our uh, local veterinarian has shared with me, and then I can put these things forward. Our goal is that all of the people in our community feel confident and comfortable bringing their animal to care as soon as they believe that that care is needed and that there's that positive dialogue around money. So fear, again, reasons why people might not bring their animals to the clinic. And again, I'm really talking companion animals here. I'm not talking large animals for the most part. Um, four stories out there. How can we help calm our clients' fears and build trust? Um, so using common language, avoiding a lot of medical jargon, sitting next to people. So we talk a lot about that bedside manner, that level of professionalism. And it's not doctors that are often doing this. It is our office staff that are doing this. It is everybody. And so making sure that we're teaching that bedside manner. Um, and misinformation. There has been and always will be misinformation. With the right approach, we can shepherd our clients towards better resources. And how do we do this? Again, I really push professionalism on my students. We talk about professionalism and bedside manner a lot. Um, and body language and patience. Um, access to better sources and listening to our clients' reasoning, never belittling them, and always offering our feedback. Um, trust and respect are the long game, and uh, we want to we want to build that relationship with our clients so that they know they can always come to us for the quality information, even if it's bad news. We want them to get their information in the right sources. So this is day two. So this is kind of getting dressed for surgery. Um, we do a little video, I'm not gonna show that now, but we do let's dress up for surgery day. It's like a big bin of PPE. It's kind of like when you used to dress up as a child. Um, we do dress up day, we do washing up, and then we do our breathe, think, talk. So I'm gonna just kind of jump ahead to the next one. All right, so this is where we're gonna get into some basic sur uh, suturing techniques. So your patient is a young female dog cat. She is to be spayed. Uh, your patient is your banana. So if you need a banana, there's some up here on the table. So beginning students, uh, I usually show the same one for my beginners as I do my advanced. Please draw an X where the surgery should be occurring and advance that student's right directions on the location where the surgery should be occurring. Use your anatomical terms for location. So earlier in the year, I get um, bull pinatas. You can get any type of animal pinata, they're big. 
and um, we have them do their anatomical directions and then they do posty notes with all of the parts. Um, so dorsal and, and all of those types of things. Um, and so those pinatas stay in the room, it belongs to their team. And so they can use their pinata at their uh, group station to identify and explain in words where the surgery should be taking place. All right. Prepping wound and prep for surgery, tremor shape of wound, surgery area, leaving half an inch surrounding area, wound edges should be exposed. Washing, uh, so we talk about wound care, so I'm sorry, this is coming back. This isn't our surgery, but this is our wound care talk because we talked about wound care prior. Um, washing the external area with uh, clinics approved scrub, irrigating wounds may be necessary, Pat, don't rub the area. We can skip that because we just kind of have them go through a lot in the process, but again, we're just gonna get to this in a second. Um, what supplies should be in your suturing pack or kit? So I brought a couple things. If you didn't pick them up, um, so we have uh, some different uh, things that you can use as a needle driver. Um, and these, I like these because they lock. And then as you do your uh, different movements, you don't have to worry about holding your needle or dropping your needle. So if you just want to practice really quick, you can lock those. It just feels good. Um, there's definitely a right way. Well, let me step back. That's not true. Um, I use Dr. Buck as my surgery video. And this is how <laughs> I hold the hemostat. This is how I was taught but my cousin is a nurse and my uncle is a surgeon. And so when I go through these types of things, this is how I was taught to hold. There's a lot of control for me here. Kids always wanna hold it like a scissor. Um, not a problem, but if you do this a lot, it really is tiring on the wrist. So I like to palm this and then clip into my left. Um, we talk, I have them do all of these whys. So needle holders or forceps, and then I ask them to name some types in their journal. Scalpel, what size, what shape do you need? And again, we've covered this earlier. So this is kind of a wrap up of this unit. Um, suture, depending on the type, size, and age of the animal, the tissue tissues you're gonna be working with and size of the wound or what you're doing. Um, we talk a lot about different types from, where did we get it from, Margaret Wilson? Patterson, they gave us a lot of expired suture. I also can get a lot of expired suture um, from people that work in industry. Um, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, but it's worth an ask. Uh, so um, the kids, I Xerox one of these, please feel free to take a suture pack with you. I just take a copy of this and a couple different ones, sometimes with different sizes, and then the kids can use their chart. There's, you know, a dissolvable, undissolvable. Uh, this is a, a web grill and it's an NSF2. So, and then there's numbers on about how much suture length you have on this. There's a lot of information on these packets that I just want them to be aware of all of the information. If you are doing a, a deep suture and it needs to be a dissolvable, then you need to, usually you're going to get the information of what you need, but I, I think kids really enjoy learning. They had no idea that it comes in different kinds and different shapes. And then when I bring out like the large animal vet needle, they're like, oh, it's made of nightmares. But, but it's like, no, that's, that's a thing. And so my kids are used to this, which is a, a filament type of suture. There's no threading the needle for this. Um, they are triple packed and they're usually packed in uh, they're sterile. So um, when they open this, it might smell of uh, rubbing alcohol or something like that. Um, but I just, I like them to have their hands on real product. Um, and so this is really nice. Buying suture new um, can be expensive. Also, you can often look on eBay for like expired suture. Sometimes you can get some sweet deals there. I'm all about that. As cheap as possible, <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Surgical sponges, and I asked them, why would we have extra surgical sponges on hand and a tattoo tool? Why might we 
what is it that we might be doing that you might need your five two uh, tool with you uh, for people that work at spay or neuter clinics or uh, barn cat uh, release spay. Um, sometimes they do an ear notch, but sometimes they do a tattoo. As well. <coughs> So day three, as you follow the procedure, write it out in your journals and talk it out as you move. When people walk into my class, um, when people walk into my class and we're doing these, uh, like, like your kids are talking to their girls a lot. They talk to a lot. Um, and that's very true. My kids are talking to themselves a lot because that is how it is going to occur, whether they go to vet school or nursing school, they make you talk out your work as you are in training. Um, and so just getting used to that, talking about what you're doing as you're doing it is a helpful skill. Um, <coughs> so they do a lot of talking and writing. Um, this isn't like a state exam test. They can talk to anybody in the room. They can talk to me, they can ask questions and I will answer them. Um, the goal, the goal is not for them to be perfect. The goal is for them to make progress. And so therefore, if they are having a brain fart, they have a stumbling block, or they didn't learn something, the goal is for them to ask. I want you to be comfortable asking. The last thing we want is doctors that don't check, people that don't ask. This is not a high stress environment for my students. Um, and this is what becomes the norm. So it's a very open assessment of their knowledge. Um, incision. So um, when we start with the bananas, usually what we do is uh, we make a little cut. So I have a little knife here. You can also use scissors. Uh, one thing that I just recommend, even though don't cut this way, because you're not going to want to hold this and suture. So lay your banana flat and then just create a suture line as you need. With the kids, we squeeze out all of the banana yumminess and we need that first. Um, but you can, and it makes it a little bit more realistic with the inside of the banana gone for today and, and ease and time. Feel free to do it like this, but the eating of the banana is the favorite part. So I'm just gonna feel free to pass this around. We do a lot of pause, like pause, not pauses, pause, like take a pause. Um, so again, my classroom is often very talkative as they're talking, using their references, using their notebook, asking good questions. Uh, but sometimes I just say to them, like, all right, everybody, let's pause. And I do this and they're like, that's so dumb. Like, yes, it is. Uh, draw in your journal where you believe you should be looking. What are you looking for? What else should you always be looking for? And so we talk a lot about other things that could complicate the day. Um, infection, all of a sudden you notice some discharge around the nose, you know, something is going weird. Just always keeping our eyes and, and being calm enough in our practice that we can see and accept what the reality of the situation is, being ready for that. Um, and then they complete their task. What suture technique is best? Where should uh, your first suture be? Where should your second suture be? Clean site, NH bandaging. Uh, is it a wet or dry wound? So we talk about what type of covering you might use for a wet or dry wound. The next one. Um, we're gonna skip that. Could you go to the um, Dr. Buck? So I like Dr. Buck, but he is a surgeon. And this video is safe, but not all of them are. So please watch your Dr. Buck videos. He's great. Um, I show this, uh, or they can pull it up on their laptop. And uh, this is what they use. He does a great job. So we're gonna watch this. Um, Dr. Buck recommends, these are the suture kits uh, that we practice on as freshmen. So we just bought these on Amazon. The kids love them. During COVID, I was able to send a lot home. Um, so um, 
With my freshmen, we only work with fruits and vegetables. You could also use a pool foam wrapped in a cloth um, because these will break down over time the more you suture them, but they last a nice long time. Uh, so this is a fairly inexpensive suture pad. It comes, I just have a bunch of random stuff in here, but it comes with a little kit that we don't really use, but it's nice. Um, I send this home as a link so if parents like around the holidays like to get a lovely educational gift for their vet loving students. This is a really fun one. Um, and there's some different uh, suturing techniques and things that they can practice. They can Um, so, I hadn't thought about that. That's a great oh, idea. Great. So, um, a couple of things. My students would know this already. They just clean. They want to keep heat up. They've done or they've washed. They've done this stuff. They're so excited. It's a great time for a deep cleaner for us to clean and kind of preserve their work. Uh, so, please feel free to get your suture out. Um, it's a suture pad. And they're super inexpensive. So if you notice as you're pulling out your suture, just miss the suture. What do you smell? Just rubbing alcohol. Why do we do that? Well, we can talk about cleanliness and hair feel uh, quite a bit. We're definitely not going to have that today. Um, and then uh, what I like to do to get started when I'm just teaching like with freshmen, you'll notice that your suture is, it's either, it can be loose, but it can also be in a little suture container like this. And I just like to grab my needle and then I just pull out my suture. And I kind of go around and talk about like, why are you like, it's just a couple of things that I set them up to fail because I don't ever want them to be afraid of criticism. Uh, but the minute that they open their suture, they're going to leave this debris right on their sterile field. They're going to leave this stuff that you touched with your hands on the sterile field. And so it's like, oh, wow, contamination. Like, what, what have you done there? And they're like, oh, but I thought, it's like, just be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of what you're doing. And, and but we don't ever want to attack them because they always need to be open to criticism and critique. So from here, so you have, you're going to have to be able to put down and pick up their needle a few times. Uh, again, safety. Uh, when working with such small needles, um, I tell them to like, you want to be near the back end. You don't want to be too close, but you also don't want to be so far back that you're bending your needle. You'll have kids bend needles. Um, it's okay. We have plenty of, you know, suture stuff. Also, they already know this, um, but when you're working with this type of entry or issue, we always start uh, near the middle. And then we kind of, so I ask them like, where are you starting? Where are you ending? Again, my goal is to have them think about how the whole thing is gonna go so that they can think about it in their mind and be calm enough to think about that. And then to come back, is it going, is it going as you like? So then um, we watch uh, Dr. Buck so we can get him playing. We, I just put him on repeat. It takes them a long time and they need to watch him and hear it. They know Dr. Buck by the end of freshman year. I just put this and I just keep showing it. And sometimes they're like, could you just go back to that one more time? I don't have to wait and listen to it again. That's not a problem. Um, the type of suture he does, he's a human surgeon. So obviously he's doing uh, uh, more than one knot and how he does it might not be how your veterinarian does it, but again, they're not, we're really not teaching this. What we're doing is we're giving them this experience to get them excited about the work. And really when they go off, if they go that far, they're gonna be taught how to do this in a way that's much different, not much different, but significantly different than we do it. Every school does things a little bit different. But again, the goal is just to 
inspire them and do these hands-on things. Um, so please go ahead. We can kind of fast forward a little bit because we talked about stitch pad. on the needle driver. You want it at a, about a 90 degree angle. I, I sometimes do a little bit of an angle forward and that's just because my arms are triangulating the spot that I want to be. It provides a 90 degree angle to the actual. No, because it should come through both, but. Other videos are like well, effing this and like he's a doctor. He's he's a grown ass man and he can say that if he wants to. But you just might want to check his videos all the way through before you. Yeah, and I just tell kids. I mean, he is a doctor. Doctor incision <laughs> site. So. But this is a really nice. He talks about the grip. Talks about where to oh, I, I do that sometimes. Second thing is how to hold. How you do your nodding, and then he does um, just a straight. He'll do like a quick lip stitch at the end, but which is the hardest part that they have with this. The part where they're not in love with this activity anymore is when they have to do their nod. The and needle driver. You want to put your thumb and your ring finger in the needle driver, not the index uh, here, not the index or the middle finger. The other way you can do it is the way I do it is you, you palm the needle driver like that. And then that gives you more kind of like degrees of freedom because you can actually twist it like this. But when you're starting out, if you want to do those two, that's just fine. Now this is a pickup. This is an Adson pickup because it's got teeth. This is specifically for skin. So you do want to use the tooth pickup with skin. So if I'm going to try and close this incision right here, I'm going to take this needle driver yeah, and, and I want to put my me, so finger know. as close to the tip of the needle driver as possible. That actually uh, makes the tip of the needle driver uh, more steady and thus the needle first. more steady. And the more things that you can rest your hands or elbows or wrists on, the more steady you're going to be. I, I turn, twist my wrist like this and I get the needle so it's going in about 90 degrees to the skin. Once it's in the depth that I like, I twist my wrist, okay? and I see the needle come out. You can close incisions with one or two bites, and this one I'm gonna do two bites. And notice what I'm gonna do here is pull the needle out just a little bit, and then I'm gonna grab the needle exactly where I want to grab it for the next bite. And that is about two thirds back, and at the tip of the needle driver. Two thirds of the way back on the needle. And now what I do is since I have this exactly where I want it, this is what's good about palming, okay. is I pull it up slowly, right? I twist and I'm actually ready for the next bite. <laughs> there it is. And notice I am palming, which is why I can make this move. And once I put that in the second side, nice I can cut. go ahead and pull this out. Now I don't have to really then, hold the needle with my yeah. uh, forceps. The reason is because once you put the needle in the tissue, the tissue should stay stable unless the patient's moving all around. And second, it'll stay stable if you hold it with the uh, forcep. So you wanna hold the tissue actually with the forcep and not the needle with the forcep. And if you hold the tissue in place and let go of the needle, the needle should stay right in place. And so then you can pick it up again. Now I can pull it out a little bit again. I'm gonna grab it right where I want the needle driver to go for the next bite, uh, but I'm not gonna actually do a next bite because we're gonna tie this. And so here's another tip here. A lot of students I see, we have this long suture here. A lot of people like pull this way high, right? You're gonna touch your face, you're gonna hit somebody else's face. If you're in a real procedure, you're gonna make it unsterile. You're gonna lay this, uh, suture way out somewhere else that's not <sighs> sterile. So here's a little tip here. What you can do is you just put your forcep right in here, okay, and you pull this along. And you want to pull this suture down so you got a few centimeters out there and the suture is sticking straight up. That's going to help later. So then I'm going to let go of the needle with this hand. Now, the needle is not really that dangerous when it's not attached to something. If it's attached to this, you know, you can poke somebody. So as long as the needle is like dangling, then typically it doesn't really um, cause any damage and won't poke through anything. So what I do here is I grab usually a couple palm lengths or so, and I'm also palming 
the forcep with my left hand. Okay, this is for right-handers. And all I do is just put the needle driver in between the tail and the length of the suture. And the first one, I usually do two wraps. So this is pretty typical. Notice how much length I have. A lot of students, they make a mistake, they go like this. And then they don't have anything, it's tight. And it's gonna get caught in these jaws. And when you open it up, it gets caught, or it gets caught in these back here. Make a big, nice loop. And then when you bring it in, okay, I kind of brought around the back, I start to make that loop. And then look how big that loop is. And then I make another loop and it's nice and big. And then I grab this tip here, which is sticking straight up for me. And then I bring this across and I pull this through, okay? And then I lay this down and you pull it a little bit tight, not too tight, just approximating the tissue. You don't want to strangulate the tissue. To set this suture so it doesn't come out for my next throw, okay, and our next I pull it like this, back. snap it like that. Okay. And even you can set it up in the air a little bit so that way it's not laying on the skin. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my so, needle driver between the long the end and the back. tail again. And, and I'm gonna make this big old loop. I don't care if it's one too big, so it's too but I don't want it too small. One to work. And then I'm gonna pull it through. That and deep. this will then right. secure that. Now I'm going back and forth and I'm gonna make a square knot. So now I'm gonna go this way. Knot. So different doctors are going to choose different numbers of knots for a lot of reasons. But notice he's again the surgeon. So look at he brought it right together. There's not pulling, there's not puckering, um, choosing the distance of your sutures from each other so that you want that perfect lineup takes practice over time. Also, I talk to kids a lot about. Uh, older tissue. So just like, you know, as we get older, our skin gets thin and fragile. My advanced kids that want to take this to the next level, I have them do it with tissue. So again, it's not because they're ever going to actually be suturing somebody near somebody's eye or in that thin skin or an older, but an older animal might have thin skin. Um, it's just getting the feel and knowing where your suture pull might be written. I didn't right, pull it up so in the air. Not you don't stop right. it, not one. Bang. We're gonna do another one. So again, boom. Two away, pull, boom. One back. Back and forth. Okay, I got a little maybe too much. Yep. Just back and forth. Okay. Okay. I'm going to Jason's. I'm going to Jason's. But you can find somebody to do it for you. Yeah. I don't I don't know if they're even hearing anything. Six, but nobody's responding to me. So I have no idea. And everything I click on, like we should we should be able to hear it, but we don't. Different doctors oh, do it different They can ways. hear. Okay. Some Thank you, Elizabeth. Do a one knot. And when I worked with uh, Margaret's vet, um, he did a single knot. When, when Are you hearing the with, video uh, sound? A double knot. He's like, oh, you must be working with a human doctor. So everybody does a different okay. knot. Thank you. I don't know why we here in person are not, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah. Right now she's helping some participants. So we're kind of, you know, student teacher one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I put a link to this video in the chat so you guys can open it up and watch the entirety if you want to. And then her PowerPoint she showed earlier will be in the Google Drive. Go ahead and ask some questions though and hopefully we can get um, Elisa to share some more.
Let's just let me just double check. Does anybody need a little bit of help? Yeah. So once you do your two knots, so cut. I mean, you you do your step. You have a little tail. When it stands up, you release two away. Grab your tail, knot, release one toward you. Grab your tail, knot. That's not one. You, my, I asked my kids to do two square knots. So then we have to start again, just like Elaine and I did. She released the tail, two away, grab your tail, pull. Release the tail, one toward you, pull. She's done two full square knots. Then you cut. So do you want to hit play again? Yeah. He's going to talk about it. So it depends on what type of suture you're doing. But, but that is essentially like simple suturing. Now this okay. is a, what we call a simple interrupted so suture See how he's or not stitch, right I guess. And oh, sorry. Okay. Just a touch of a tail. That's perfect. That's perfect. And we just don't cut down to the knot because you don't want to uh, lessen the integrity of that knot. Also, there's nothing we can do if we need to restitch that. We're going to cut that out and we'll restitch it if your knot isn't holding. But um, yeah, it'll be so, fine. <laughs> now, does it matter if we go towards the top or the bottom? Um, no, it doesn't matter. So you can go uh, usually, depending on the wound, or depending on what uh, we're doing, you can go right next to above or below. And then you, for drainage, you want what quarter of an inch? Mm -hmm. between them? Yeah, again, it depends, but that's, I ask kids to put about a quarter inch in between their stitches. And I say, I want beautiful, beautiful stitches. I want them to be equidistant. I want the tails all to match and I don't want any puckering. I want it to be, it's like quilting. I want those lines to line up. What's that? <laughs> They're not going to so, catch me, Margaret. Here. They're not going to catch me. Like, to be completely fair, the reason I give so much time and poking around, please critique your students with love. Please get them used to you saying, oh, no, that's not right. Let's do this again. Cut that one out. Don't let them get so frustrated that they forget their breath, that so they true. forget their professionalism. If they need to walk away, because I have some kids, especially my football boys, man, some of them are super competitive. And when they can't get that suture to work, after three, they're pissed. It's like, all right, let's just go do something else with you for a little bit because we don't get that luxury. You need to manage your breath. You need to manage what you're doing. And that's just part of learning to, to, to be in that headspace of that where you need to be. And if you were my class right now, I'd say, I'm not hearing anybody talk through their steps. You need to talk through. I'm your college professor. I'm going to be asking you what you're doing. I don't hear what you're doing. So again, having them talk it out. And you go towards you. Okay, this part? Probably this exactly where I want it, this is what's good about palming, is I pull this it up slowly, starting. right? Yeah. I twist and I'm actually ready for the next bite. There it is. And notice I am palming, which is why I can make this move. Oh, yeah. Once I put that in the second side, I can go ahead and pull this out. Now I don't have to really hold the needle I don't with know how to do that, my I uh, forceps. The reason is because once you put the needle in the tissue, the tissue should stay stable unless the patient's moving all around. And second, it'll stay stable if you hold it with the uh, 
forcep. So you want to hold the tissue actually with the forcep and not the, the two, needle with the forcep. And you, if you hold the tissue in place and let go of the needle, the needle so should stay that, right in place. Second, and so then you can pick you, it up again. It now I can pull it out a little bit again. I'm going to grab it right where I want the needle right. driver to go for the next bite, so, uh, but I'm not going to actually do a next bite because we're going to tie this. And so here's another tip here. A lot of students I see, we have this long suture here. A lot of people like pull this way high, right? You're gonna touch your face, you're gonna hit somebody else's face. If you're in a real procedure, you're gonna make it unsterile, you're gonna lay this uh, suture way out somewhere else that's not sterile. So here's a little tip here, what you can do is you just put your forcep right in here, okay, and you pull this along. And you wanna pull this suture down until you got a few centimeters out there and the suture is sticking straight up, that's gonna help later. So then I'm gonna let go of the needle with this hand, now, the needle is not really that dangerous when it's not attached to something. If it's attached to this, you know, you can poke somebody. So as long as the needle is like dangling, then typically it doesn't really um, cause any damage and won't poke through anything. So what I do here is I grab usually a couple palm lengths or so, and I'm also palming the forcep with my left hand. Okay, this is for right-handers. And all I do is just, Put the needle driver oh, in between the tail and, and the length of the suture. And the first one, oh, I usually do right two here. wraps. So this is pretty typical. Notice how much length I have. A lot of students, they make a mistake, they go like this. And then they don't have anything, it's tight. And it's gonna get caught in these jaws when you open it up, it gets caught, or it gets caught in these back here. Make a big, nice loop. And then when you bring it in, okay, I kind of brought around the back, I start to make that loop. And then look how big that loop is. And then I make another loop and it's nice and big. And then I grab this tip here, which is sticking straight up. Go to the for me and, and then I bring, bring this across and I pull the this through uh, okay and then I lay this down and you pull it a little bit tight not too tight to do with their hands, like, just okay. approximating the you know, tissue you don't want to strangulate the tissue to set this suture so it doesn't come out for and my next throw I pull it like this Really love snap this. it like that. And, and even you can set it up in the air a little bit so that way it's not really laying on the skin. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my needle driver so between like the long it. end and the tail um, again. And I'm gonna make this big old loop. Um, I don't care if it's again, too big, is but I don't want it too small. And then I'm gonna pull it through. And this will then secure that. Uh, now I'm going back and forth and I'm gonna make a square <laughs> knot. So now I'm gonna go this way. I didn't pull it up in the air, right? Bang. Make sure so you can send it. Oh, Boom. I guess you are your own administrator. Boom. <laughs> Back and forth. Okay, I got a little, maybe too much there. But that is essentially Hot simple a, um, suturing. Now this is a, what we call a simple interrupted suture. Mm -hmm. Or not stitch, I guess. And there are lots of different types of sutures COVID, and knots. Like, hey, and can I borrow some? Well, I've sewed them up, but and, uh, they loved it. Yeah, so it's really not fair. So Margaret and I, I reached out to Peterson Veterinary and it turned out that they had a storage unit full of stuff they needed to get rid of. So Margaret and I were on that like white on rice. Margaret brought the truck and they loaded us up. And so a lot of the sutures that I have now is from, I mean, lots and lots of sutures. Um, but my, my cousin is a nurse. My uncle is a surgeon, and so oh, expired stuff. It's like, hey, well, if they can just get checked out. out. So I just, it's kind of like asking around. Yeah, but if, yeah, it is connections, but if, if everybody's like, no, we don't get anything sharp, there's a lot of rules. Um, I try to find you for expired on eBay or off Every once in a while, you can get a big bag. Um, and if you have to buy it, you just buy it. But that just might mean that, Right now, I have so much suture that I'm feeling really luxurious that I can do this with freshmen. And then when they come back to it with advance, they are like, oh, I liked this. Even if they hated it, they're like, oh, yeah, I loved it. So um, again, uh, I just finished. Well, I, I'm not sure if you've read um, Melinda French Gates's book, Moment of Lift. But Melinda, she went to a private girls Catholic school. And there is a nun there 
that insisted that the girls have access to computers when she was young and the internet. Like, it's not that we learned how to do anything well, it's just that we were exposed to these unusual cutting edge ideas. And that when she went off to college, she already knew about stuff and she felt comfortable around stuff and that empowered her as a woman in technology. And so I think about that when like I ordered uh, the Casper CPR dogs and um, teaching these things using the micro pipettes, the nice ones. If you do the SEP program at the Fred Hutch, which is a tour, uh, Lonnie and I both have been through that program. You have access to their storage of stuff that scientists are getting rid of. I have gotten classroom sets of my uh, classroom uh, pipettes, nice ones. When young people get their hands on real equipment, it empowers them. Um, we do a lot of dissecting. I'm always flattered when my kids say the best thing that I learned in your class was that I was the only one in my class in college that knew how to use a micro pipette. Or, you know, when they dissected that cat in my nursing program, I didn't even get nauseous. Like I knew what I was doing the second time yeah. I've done it. And those are the little wins that inspire yeah. and empower. And, and some kids just don't end up anything but they'll always have this experience and they they show their bananas to their friends they take pictures you know parents are impressed um it's just it's a cool thing so um if they're if you need a couple extra uh bits of suture to take uh, feel free you can eat your banana because these are all sterile and and that's really it. So I just encourage you to take this back. Um, this PowerPoint will probably be put in the drive. So please, uh, please lie, cheat, and steal, and put your name on it. And add what you need to make it yours. Um, and um, I know for, if you guys are in vet, vet um, Margaret and I at vet competitions, we still have some leftover equipment and thing, little things. A lot of gauze. <laughs> Both of those pieces of this big filled with shit that has to be Yeah. We also have knees. <laughs> yeah. lots, lots, of lots of knees. Of knees. <laughs> they're not human knees. I didn't know when we went into it. I was hopeful, but they're just dog, they're dog <laughs> knees. Um, Margaret hosted a wonderful event with her veterinarian. Knees are actually really challenging. Yes. And it's definitely not for us. It was, it was rough. so hard. Um, but, and we did it with adults. These have to be done with adults because they are formaldehyde based. Um, but just, she invited her vet and they talked about what is a knee reconstruction in a dog? What is that torn ACL? Where did we find things? Um, Mad respect yeah. to doctors, to surgeons that redo knees. They literally have an engineer person who comes in. Every knee is customly cut out and reformatted um, for that animal. And you wonder why it costs so much to get any knee surgery on a dog. <laughs> um, but it was cool. But please don't use, if you do grab some knees, please don't use those with students. That would be safety protocol because they are. The day. I know. So these are one of a kind. The hot black market <laughs> item. Yeah. Yeah. When in doubt, just ask. Any questions? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. It died. So that was the thing about like, I need to be out by 11 because somebody else is using it at 11. So you'll, when you log in, you'll see if the meeting is still recording or not. If it is, wait till 11 and then hit go. All right, you guys, if there's no questions, we're gonna log off the Zoom and we'll post everything we can to the Google Drive you'll find on the website. Perfect, thank you all.